Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Please join me. Eternal God, in every age, you have raised up people to live and die in faith. We confess that we are indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name, but we are silent. You call us to do what is just, but we remain idle. You call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow in your way that joined with those from ages past who have served you with faith, hope, and love. We may inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Oh, yeah, Jesus. Found in Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up a mountain. He sat down, and his disciples came to him, saying, He taught them, saying, Happy are people who are hopeless, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are people who grieve, because they will be made glad. Because they will inherit the earth. Happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, because they will be fed until they are full. Happy are people who show mercy, because they will receive mercy. Happy are people who have pure hearts, because they will see God. Happy are people who make peace, because they are called God's children. Happy are the people whose lives are harassed because they are righteous, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you, all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harass the prophets who came before you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our third reading this morning comes to us from the book of Revelation in chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation. And before the Lamb, they wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. All the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell face down before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. Then one of the elders said to me, who are those people wearing white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. Then he said to me, these people have come out of great hardship. 
They have washed their robes and made them white in the lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple, and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them, because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of truth, the gospel for our salvation. Thanks be to God. Out of Apocalypse, hope. Our third lesson this morning for our commemoration of all the saints is from John's Apocalypse, most well known as the book of Revelation. This particular vision that John of Patmos has occurs within the midst of judgment. We find ourselves directly between the opening of the sixth and seventh seals, signifying God's wrath against the empire. And yet, it's in the midst of these cosmological terrors that we find this word of hope. In the text, this multitude, this uncountable mass of humanity from everywhere, speaking every language of every background, has come out of subjugation and oppression. They are the early Christians who faced the horrors of Rome for the sake of the gospel. They are the huddled masses yearning to be free. They are the poor who survived even in the midst of all that a death-dealing society can throw at them. They are the multitude, Jewish and Christian and everybody else who has endured marginalization at the hands of the Roman Empire. This is the tribulation to which John writes. These are those who are on the underside. For this apocalypse is for all, then is now, whom the Bible spends so much time giving good news to. The poor, the oppressed, the vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, the outsider, the marginalized. And God, like a good shepherd, tenderly cares for them all. They are protected from this wrathful, violent judgment that God has planned against the systems of the imperial status quo. And this is, as scholar Barbara Rossing puts it, quote, a dramatic new exodus being undertaken not in Egypt, but in the heart of the Roman Empire, end quote. John's apocalypse understands that while those who follow Jesus are counted among this multitude, that we should notice in the text that this envisioned mass of the robes, robed who cry out are not simply those found within the church. For remember, as Matthew reminds us, that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the realm of God. But rather, this mass is inclusive of everyone who has been victimized by the empire. This vision is an explicit, albeit imaginary, look at what it will be like when God as Mary's song that we will soon hear as we go into the Advent season mightily proclaims in the Gospel of Luke, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. Those who have faced the brunt of what we can do to one another find succor. Those who are vulnerable will ever find shelter and life-giving water as they are protected by God, who will wipe every tear from their eye. And the converse, for the powers of principalities who have done so much to so many begins in the very next chapter, as those trumpets of doom sound, pouring down wrath upon wrath on the empire. John's vision promises hope to all who have been hopeless. 
even as it promises fulfillment of our scriptural narrative that throughout that has pointed to the eventual overturning of everything that is wrong to make everything right again. The lifting up of the lowly and the pulling down of the mighty and the final destruction of our true enemies. Mammon, the embodiment of economic power. Moloch, the embodiment of war and violence. And of course, death itself. And that last one is probably why our text that we're hearing this morning is usually only ever heard in churches during things like All Saints or during memorial services and funerals. For those who have suffered now find shelter and rest in God's presence. A fitting hope for our loved ones who have gone ahead of us. For they no longer hurt or thirst. The scorching heat no longer beats down on them. And every tear is wiped from their face by our parent, God, God's self. But our text today is even more than that. It's a promise. A promise that the promises made by God to the vulnerable will be kept. And it's a promise that the judgment proclaimed upon those powers and principalities of the world and upon those who uphold and benefit from the empire will also be kept. For justice shall be done even as, of course, mercy and peace will as well. But friends, this is not just a vision of the end times as our cult, popular, popular culture believes. For it is a word of hope for us in the here and now as well in the midst of all the chaos and confusion of our time, just as it was a word of hope for those who had suffered under Rome in their time. And it's a reminder of three very important things. That even those of us who seek to, as Matthew last week reminded us, to love God with everything we've got and love our neighbors ourselves, even we will not escape hardship in our lives. Our baptisms never promised health, wealth, or success. We are not promised easy lives as Christians, only a cross. And nor are, we, nor are we meant to find comfort in the arms of the empire and its promises of security and prosperity. Two. But the converse of this is that even in the midst of all those things in which we suffer in our lives, God is with us and shall never abandon us. Our God is with us always, seeking the good in every situation and dreaming us into a new reality in which all things will be made new while seeking to work even those terrible things that happened for the good. And last, third, that embodiment of the already but not yet of God's reign invites us to dream alongside God and to seek to make happen in ways large and small in everything that we do. Not just as a community together called the church, but in those things that we can do ourselves, in the ways in which we do our jobs, in the ways in which we care about the people in our lives and beyond in the people and things that we vote for, in the ways we spend our money and time, and in the ways that we treat those who are labeled enemy. As scholar Dean Fleming writes, quote, these magnificent promises assure us that everything God has promised his people will be realized through the slain and risen lamb. But they also remind us of our mission now, to become the healing, life-giving ministry of the Lamb for a broken world. We are called to embody God's future, to serve as a signpost and presence of new creation now. That's Revelation's vision of who we are and what we are about in the world. End quote. Death. Be not proud, though some have called you mighty and dreadful, yet you are not so. For those whom you think you can overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet can you kill me. One short sleep past, 
we wake eternally and death shall be no more. Death, you will die. Friends, this morning, let us continue our commemoration of the saints as we remember all of those who have died so far in this nation from COVID-19. Please pray with me. Hear us in the silence, O Lord, as we symbolically lift up all of your beloved children in this country whose lives have been stolen from us by this horrendic, horrendous pandemic. As we once again enter into a time of remembrance, we will hold one second of silence for every 1,000 people who have died as of this morning, which is now just over 230,000 of us. Hear us, O Lord, in the silence. God of compassion, you know our suffering and hear our cries. 
Trusting in your unending grace, we place all of our hope in you. Embrace us in our agony. Comfort us in our sorrow. Help us in our distress. We trust that you have received these, your children, into your eternal realm, where there is no more crying and no more pain. Sustain them by your mercy and confirm in us your promise of everlasting peace. And stand with us in this lament as we sing the second verse of the Kyrie. <laughs> Understanding in these ongoing moments of shock and sorrow and open our eyes, hearts, and hands to the movements of your spirit that we might be comforted and comfort others in the name of Christ, our healer and our light. With Job of old, we cry out, everywhere the innocent suffer, our desires and efforts achieve little. O oh God, are you good, yet you do nothing to help? Our answers have holes, and we fall through. these words and receive their power. The majesty of God the parent undergirds all that is. The mercy of God the child accepts our despair. The peace of God the spirit embraces us in communities of care. Thanks be to God. The peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the parent, the child, and the Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen.